The problem of, of food production is, is, is one that has always been around for a long, long time, but it is now a problem of enormous magnitude and the future predictions are that this problem will uh, increase as, as time goes by. We currently are 7 billion, just over 7 billion people in the world and 1 billion out of the 7 billion suffer from starvation, malnutrition and lack of food. Of this 1 billion people, many thousands, hundreds of thousands will actually die from starvation, lack of food. Others uh, will suffer terrible, terrible diseases because of malnutrition. In the words of Jean Ziegler, who was a special United Nations representative, the rapporteur on food policy, today's hunger is extremely different. Today's hunger is almost exclusively man-made. There are no natural causes I know natural problems for why we have such levels of malnutrition. It is man-made and it is caused by the nature of the economic system that we currently have. Uh, part of the problem relates to how food production today is controlled by a tiny number of transnational corporations that control every aspect of the food production system. And these small number of transnational corporations, often no more than eight or nine of them, have control over what is produced, how, is, how it is produced, where it's produced, for whom it's produced, and how much to charge for the food that is produced. All of these transnational corporations see food primarily as a commodity to be exchanged for profits. Today, food is not considered some kind of uh, essential requirement that satisfies the needs of humankind. Today, it's primarily considered a commodity that can be exchanged on the marketplace like anything else. And Almost the exclusive purpose of exchanging commodities on the marketplace is to make money. And these transnational corporations look to the food uh, distribution system and production system as a means of making money. And if money and making profit means that certain people suffer from malnutrition and starvation, they, they have no problem with that. That is not their concern. They say that is not our problem. In recent years, additional factors have started to play a role. A lot of the food that is produced in the world is now increasingly not being used for the purposes of uh, feeding human beings. This is particularly the case in some countries in Latin America. If you take a country like Paraguay, for example, uh, virtually 85-90% of soya production in Paraguay, and all of this production of this commodity, soya, is now owned by transnational corporations, 85-90% to 90 of the soya production in Paraguay is used for animal feed production. Another problem here is that a great deal of food production these days is used for the making of biofuels, ethanol. In terms of maize, for example, um, more than 50% of the world's production of maize, which is such a crucial food product, more than 50% of maize today is used to make biofuels energy. Less than half of the world production of maize is actually used for 
human consumption. It's sustainable in, 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 in one sense, in the sense that for as long as you have these transnational corporations controlling every aspect of the food production system, and for as long as they make profits from this, then they will see no reason why they should change this. If using food to make biofuel is a means of making huge profits, they are not going to change the system. You can use whatever moral arguments you want against how food is used by these companies, but no moral argument will persuade them <laughs> that they should voluntarily relinquish the huge profits that they make from, from, from this. The food production system that, 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 that dominates is one that is on a huge, vast corporate scale. It's highly mechanized, it's highly industrialized, it's highly chemicalized. Um, and there is very little need for uh, human labor in this production system. In the last 10, 20 years where this corporate system of food production has started to penetrate uh, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, where we see the real effects on small-scale farmers and peasants in these countries. Basically, as the dominant European economic Canadian model of food production has penetrated into these developing countries, the first thing that's happened is that uh, the peasants that used to work the land have been forced off the land. Most of them have no other choice in order to survive than to move into urban areas and into the poor slum quarters that are <coughs> developing in the urban areas. But some in more recent years have started to say, no, we don't want to be faced with the choice of moving into urban conditions that are going to be dreadful. This is our livelihood, this is our way of life. We want to try and resist these corporate forces that are destroying our ancestral traditions, our long-standing culture of uh, small-scale food production. And it's the peasants themselves that have gradually started to build up the capacity to resist these forces. This peasant scale resistance has now reached worldwide levels. The key movement that tries to coordinate and organize peasant resistance to this corporate model of food production is known as Via Campesina and the origins of Via Campesina go back to the early 1990s and was an attempt to realize that the only way you can struggle, fight this corporate model is to stand up and resist. For the peasants not to be forced off the land, not to move into the slum, urban slums, but to somehow fight and resist. So Via Campesina was an attempt to try and build links between Asian peasants, African peasants, and peasants here in Latin America to say, well, on your own you can't do anything, but perhaps together, working together, trying to organize together, trying to act together, trying to learn from each other's experience of how we might possibly resist these forces, uh, maybe together we, we can do something. And in, since the early 1990s that Via Campesina has been in existence, it has now become the largest social movement of any kind that exists globally. It exists, it has a base in more than 80 countries across the world, and it's brought together something like 150, 160 different individual peasant organizations in different countries and has provided a, an organization and a structure for these different movements to, uh, to work and to, to act. The rural and the urban worlds 
related in so many ways. And even if you are someone that has never lived in the countryside or experienced rural life, if your whole existence is based upon urban conditions, uh, this doesn't mean to say that you're not affected by uh, what is going on in the rural, rural world. I mean, the two are absolutely, absolutely connected. They're connected even more these days because, as I say, part of the problem of urban, the, the growth of urban poverty, is the simple fact that urban poverty is growing because more and more peasants are being forced off the land and being forced into the poor urban neighbourhoods uh, on the outskirts, mainly on the outskirts of big cities. And that is increasing the urban levels of, 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 of poverty. The two situations are interlinked. The two levels of poverty are fundamentally interlinked. We have to find ways in which, in order to decrease urban poverty, we try to get the peasants that have been dispossessed of their land back onto the land. The only people at the moment that are having a major impact on trying to resist this dehumanization of life that is taking place this commodification of absolutely everything that exists around us. And the only forces at the moment that are strongly, desperately trying to resist these, these trends are the most marginalised, dispossessed forces, both in the rural areas and in the urban areas. For the first time in many years, what we see with these rural peasant movements prepare to take that enormous risk of waging a struggle to rebuild life in the rural areas. What we see in the urban areas of extreme poverty, of people trying to build new kinds of community in these slum, slum areas, has to be a sign of hope. What they are doing is saying, you know, there are different ways of living. There are different ways of living with each other. There are different ways of interacting with each other. There are ways of living with each other, interacting with each other, that transcend, that go beyond relationships of exchange and profit, and that genuinely seek to bring back a notion of human warmth, human community. These people are not waging a struggle to enrich themselves. These people are not waging a struggle to get out of poverty, to become part of, of, of the rich. These people are waging a struggle to bring back a human dimension to life, to show us that there are values and attributes of humanity that are universal and that all of us should be seeking to uh, bring back into our own lives. That the notion of exchange value so dominates the notion of use value that we have to somehow reverse that, 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 that trend. And for me, at least, they, 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 they are an inspiration. I mean, what I've seen in the communities that have been built on the occupied land in places like Brazil and elsewhere, what I see happening in the slum communities where resistance is taking place, is the redevelopment of communities and people working with each other, interacting with each other in different ways that I genuinely do find inspiring, and I genuinely, genuinely do find, is a model that ha has to be the basis upon which the future is somehow uh, to, be, to, uh, to be built. But I'm, I, uh, I'm not the utopian romantic that says, we can do without exchange, an exchange system, we can do without some kind of market system of supply and demand and 
buying and, and, and selling. Well, that's, that's natural to the human condition. But even if it's one in which, you know, one of the primary motives is to sell and to, to make money, it was done in a way, it can be done in a way that still preserves some kind of human essence, human contact, human relationship at work in that process. What we're seeing today is this process of dehumanization. And as I say, I, 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 I have no qualms about calling this anthropological genocide. It's the genocide of everything that human existence and that the human potential has about it. And we are all affected by that, no matter what our status, what our position, what our conditions of wealth. We are all affected by by this process. And as I say, the fact that it's the lowest of the low that have found the courage to embark upon a process of trying to resist these, 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 these forces, I just find incredible and inspiring. And, you know, our future depends on that kind of, 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 of struggle taking place.